And we're back. So that was the first talk with Sebastian and we have a second Sebastian for you uh, so that we can offer you a choice of different speakers with the same first name. What a coincidence. <laughs> Hello, Sebastian. <laughs> Hi. Where, where are you dining in from? I am from Poland as well, from the oh, center good. of it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, let me sh uh, introduce you, you a little bit. Uh, your full name is Sebastian Buczynski. I hope I got that right. Yeah, and it's close enough. It's fine. Close, for, close I, enough. I know it's it's tricky one. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you work for a company called Web Interpret as a principal software engineer. Yes, that's right. And uh, uh, I can I, I saw that you've been using Python for uh, nearly a decade. And today you are talking about old applications and something um, that, of course, if you've used Python for a long time, then you might have to fix your own ones. <laughs> but are you ready to uh, present your talk? Yes, I'm ready as my okay, be. So the topics are refactoring a legacy Django app using OOP. Uh, the stage is yours. OK, thanks. So uh, let's let's start. Uh, so apart from uh, all the facts that already were said about me, I also happen to write a book about implementing the clean architecture, of course, in Python. I write a blog under breadcrumbscollector.tech, and I'm on the mission of advocating software engineering in Python world. And that's the reason why I'm here and also moves us smoothly to the topic of the presentation, which is a refactoring. And the simplest definition I could find is the improving just just improving the design of existing code uh, from the state it is uh, in the current, and we do not like it, and we want it to to make it better. And if you think about it, well, refactor is is a kind of a journey when we move from one place to another. But on a very technical, in a code level, uh, let's see a simple example. So you have a bunch of code, and uh, well, you see that a uh, piece of it can be reused. So uh, you name it, you extract it to a separate function, and you just reuse it uh, whenever you want to. So this transformation has an, a name, and it's called extract function. And believe me or not, but there are dozens of such transformations recognized already. Uh, but I assume you already know that, because this is an intermediate session. Maybe you don't know all the names, but you certainly I have used them before if you have ever read, write, wrote some code in the past. So I won't be focusing on that. Uh, if you're looking for some reference guide, there is a refactoring by Martin Fowler or refactoring.guru, which is a catalog of these uh, uh, transformations. So if these individual transformations uh, are uh, uh, steps in our refactoring journey, uh, then we must remember that like for every journey or for every activity, there are some basic hygiene rules. And the same is true for refactoring. So the first rule is that we do not refactor without tests because we need to have some a way of verifying that the code still works or does the same thing that it did before we started refactoring. The big bank rewrite, this is not a refactoring. This is something that went very wrong and we just are uh, working uh, hard to, to undo the damage. And so what's the best moment to refactor? Well, I can't back advices, and this is an author of TDD book, uh, that we do refactor right before implementing new feature. So if we are about to add or change something, then first we do the hard work of refactoring to make the change easy. And only then we implement the change. However, this is a great piece of advice. However, don't get me wrong, it works best in a clean code basis when you have a discipline, when you're using TDD and so on. And more often than we would like to, we start off in the places that doesn't look like that or more look like a pile of trash. Uh, but don't worry, I got you. For the purpose of this talk, I prepared the example Django legacy Django application, which is inspired by a real world one. Of course, it has been obfuscated to, you know, uh, after all, it's inspired after a production code base. And uh, the application would be uh, some booking. Uh, it will have some booking logic in it. And uh, this will be a Django application as I mentioned with Django REST framework. So let's assume there is an endpoint when you can book a few things at once. And what are they? Well, let's assume that you can, for example, uh, reser uh, reserve some tickets uh, to an amusement park, to a museum, or a book a table in a restaurant in advance, and pay for it 
uh, at once. So this is like a checkout process, some sort. And there are also a couple of other fields, but they are not relevant, so we just skip them. This is not important for this talk. And moving forward uh, to, into the serializer, we see that it does its standard job. And if you don't know the Django REST framework, it will just grab the data that's uh, come with the request and will just create an object in the database to save it eventually. And the logic is as follows. First, we try to validate payment card with zero authentication. If you don't know what that is, is that we can just try to authenticate zero amount of given currency to check if the card details are correct. If it failed, then we just set on the booking that, that something went wrong, and we just finish the control. Uh, otherwise, uh, we check if there's anything to pay in advance, because for amusement park and for museum, you can pay in advance. You just, well, you can have a ticket for children or for adults, whatever. But for a table in a restaurant, you don't pay in advance. You will just pay the bill after you finish the meal. So that's kind of logic. Uh, that sometimes this branch of logic will be entered, sometimes not. And then you have a, a transaction, and then you will try to authorize uh, payment uh, once again using the booking object. And if it failed, then we'll just send some email about the failure. And now the control moves to a mysteriously named function called finish booking. And if you enter it, it uh, instantiates a class called finish booking command, which has yet another method called the same as the method of a serializer finished booking. Uh, then we see some error handling, namely if the booking itself failed, that we have to undo the payment and send the email. And uh, well, if we captured, uh, if we uh, authorized some money in advance, that we need to capture it. So this is an operation when we really take the money. And in the end, we uh, sync. Uh, the booking with the CRM so that other departments in the company know that something such as this has happened. And I want to uh, draw your attention a bit to the decorator you can see here, and this is static method. So I wrote a blog post uh, about static method in particular called static method considered a code smell. This doesn't mean it's necessarily a wrong thing, but if you look at, uh, if you have a static method in your class, it probably means that maybe it doesn't belong here or on the other hand, it can be taken out very easy because it doesn't use anything from the class. Maybe it's there for another reason. So let's just think about it as an opportunity to refactor, but not necessarily a bad thing. But com coming back to the code, if you look into the finish booking command, this mysteriously mysterious class, uh, you can see that here we call the API of the booking provider. Uh, we do some error handling, although it's pretty useless. And yet another method is used and update booking, another static method, and we just set some field in the booking and we save it. And well, if you look at this class, it doesn't really, I, I would say it's really a function in disguise because all it does is just, someone had a good gut feeling that the serializer is becoming too big, but just move it to another class that, well, isn't really, uh, isn't really a good modeling uh, example. Uh, but it's not everything yet. Uh, in that system, uh, there was a situation that we had to support a few payment providers at once. And to steer it, we used uh, uh, so-called feature flags. These are simple Boolean uh, flags that can be set in the Django admin panel to steer which payment provider we use. So one of them had a dedicated uh, SDK library, which we could use, but it has its own API. It uh, has its own uh, arguments, and it uh, signaled errors by writing exceptions. And by the same time, we had to support the old legacy one. And this also had some SDK, but it was much worse. And it didn't raise exception, but it uh, returned errors uh, as, a, as a return, a return uh, values from the, from the calls. And if you ask yourself, how could this happen? How people let this code deteriorate so, so bad? Well. Such things usually happen uh, thanks to uh, several factors. One of them is that we are not given time to refactor. Maybe we don't make the time, as I mentioned in this method, when we always refactor before introducing a new feature. Maybe we aren't knowledgeable enough about good software design, so we just you know, try to uh, stay afloat. And this is, at a certain point of career, pretty, uh, pretty normal. You should have mentors, and we are always uh, learning uh, all the time. So, so it's also fine. And uh, sometimes we're working under extreme time pressure. So just to add new features. So it's always easy to just 
scramble some code into existing structures instead of thinking how to refactor them. And uh, we were also work on too many uh, tasks or projects at once, so which also is not uh, good for our concentrations and focus. We cannot just think about better ways how to do things. But these things mostly contribute to so-called accidental complexity. So, OK, this code base is bad, could be better. And the, uh, the relief there is to just refactor, to apply these transformations, OK? So these are things that can be uh, refactored away. And we can just do better. Uh, for example, this uh, useless error handling. We could just not use it, and it would be good. Uh, but if we look at the system again, and uh, we see there's pretty much, uh, pr pretty lot uh, other systems that we have to cooperate with. And these are like these two payment providers. There is a booking provider. This, there is this internal CRM. And there is this email gateway. And uh, so it, it means that, well, it will be just complex because there's a lot of mo moving things in this system. And if we look closely, if we zoom in into the code base, you will see that the design doesn't really, uh, doesn't really support this in any way. Literally every class talks to every other system or like exceptions may be leaked to serializer which from the booking provider, which was not like, uh, doesn't show uh, uh, intentions of this design. And also, if we try to transform this algorithm that I just was browsing through it in the code, uh, we can uh, visualize in the form of a decision tree. Uh, this is a bit simplified because it doesn't have this feature toggle. But my point is that this code is complex not only because uh, someone was uh, working under time pressure or wasn't knowledgeable enough at the time of writing, but it's also that this feature is just inherently complex. And this is called essential complexity. So we have no way to escape it. We all, the only way to deal with it is to manage it. And if you don't want to manage it, then the only solution that's left is not to implement it at all. So, well, it's not an option, obviously. So we need a way to cope with the essential complexity. And so it just happens that these object-oriented design folks have been uh, dealing with it for, uh, well, decades now, I guess. And we will use it uh, to, to, uh, to manage this complexity. And just a short reminder what object-oriented programming is. So we model a data and behavior together in a form of objects. And we'll have plenty of it. But an important note here is the fact that you are writing classes doesn't make your code object-oriented yet. Look, that code that I just showed you had classes. Yet the design, well, didn't look like an intelligent one for me. At least not the, as the whole. Yeah, It wasn't very intentional. Uh, because the good object-oriented design would be like, like cells creating an organism. Well, uh, of course, it's still a, a system composed of small parts. But each individual part is pretty amazing and pretty smart. Yeah, and the cells in the bio biologic organism are pretty smart. And there are a lot of mechanisms inside, which makes individual cell pretty, pretty, uh, pretty great. Or like a community members, there are individuals. They do cooperate with each other, but they still are smart. And well, objects are smart when they can do something with the data they know. And we'll see some examples in a moment. Or another example, an analogy of what the good object-oriented design is like, is like actors performing a play. Maybe this is even better than the community because actors are like there for a reason. Uh, they are they are cooperating together to achieve some goal of, of uh, well performing a play, and uh, but each of them is also uh, individual. Uh, yeah. So if we think about object-oriented programming, we uh, often find ourselves uh, with uh, a basic uh, basic features of object-oriented programming, like inheritance, composition, encapsulation, abstraction, polymorphism. Or if we dig deeper for maybe good practices, we'll find a bunch of uh, smart uh, acronyms like SOLID, GRASP, and a bunch of rules like tell, don't ask, or law of the matter. And well, don't get me wrong. It's all true, and it's helpful. Yet there's another take on object-oriented programming that has been overlooked a, a bit. And I think it's the right one to start with if you only want to learn what the object-oriented programming is all about and you want to unleash its power. And this is responsibility-driven design. 
And uh, don't get me wrong, this is not wrong. Uh, th this is not uh, uh, not old. Uh, this is not oh, oh my god. This is not new. This is twenty years old concept at all. Uh, at all. Uh, it has been described in a number of books that I will just show in the end of the presentation. And responsibility driven design uh, focuses on three aspects of modeling. Objects, of course. So first of all, we have collaborations, meaning how do objects talk to each other, which objects see each other, etc. And responsibilities of the individual objects. And responsibilities are three things. What object knows, what object does, and what it decides about. So we, in the responsibility driven design, we are very uh, conscious about assigning responsibilities to individual objects. And in the end, we have roles. So roles are basically just sets of responsibilities. And it's all to answer one burning question. Where do I put that code in an object-oriented code base so it makes sense? And in order to do that, uh, responsibility-driven design gives us a very handy tool, which is called role stereotypes. And if you think about uh, some movies you watch in the past, uh, you should notice that there is a hero, a good, good guy usually, uh, he has a companion. Uh, sometimes uh, the companion is funny, and there's also a bad guy, uh, which uh, who makes the life of a main character miserable or creates a conflict or some crisis to tackle. And if you look at another movie or a TV series, uh, maybe completely different, uh, you can see the same patterns. Uh, like there's a hero, uh, he has a companion, and there's also a bad guy who threatens the entire world. Uh, don't tell me you don't see patterns here. Uh, so this is called, uh, in storytelling, uh, characters archetypes. So these are like very basic blueprints for different types of characters when you're constructing a story. And the same thing for object-oriented programming uh, is called role stereotypes of RDD. And there are six of them. And we'll just focus on three because I want to show you something practical that you can use and apply in your project. And I won't be like, uh, uh just reading you out loud the definitions and so regarding information holder well the inform the name is pretty self-explanatory but let's dig a bit deeper so information holder is something that knows and provides information for others and uh well in case of uh, django models it's pretty uh, uh it's pretty obvious that th they are uh, fitting into this role stereotype because they do have do no information by uh, keeping the fields inside, which eventually get to the database. Uh, but look about other things that are less, a bit less obvious. Uh, this total property uh, is meant to provide a total for this booking uh, by assuming uh, all the uh, pre-booking totals. So we will just do some calculations. So it doesn't only keep the data inside, but it also can do some basic calculation. Remember the part about making objects smart? So this is one side of it. Uh, if, an, if we make an object keep the data, but also uh, let it calculate something based on the data it has, we make it smarter. And this is called a law of the matter, which I showed you, uh, showed you a bit earlier. Uh, so uh, in this example, a, uh, a law of the matter is because we do not uh, iterate over or uh, pre-bookings uh, outside of the booking, we let it do inside. So now one has to do booking that pre-bookings and then iterate over it. Uh, we just go one object further into the hierarchy. So that's the law of the matter. And the second thing, if we have to change some data inside an object, maybe we can just change it without uh, checking any conditions. But maybe uh, there are some, I don't know, uh, validations we have to make, some conditions we have to check. So for example, in this file payment, uh, we must assume that the status is none. So meaning that the booking is probably uh, new and hasn't been like, uh, is, is new and hasn't been, uh, hasn't been done anything on it. And only if the status is none, we can change the status to failed payment. And this is another object-oriented uh, principle or an advice, so to speak, tell, don't ask, which means we don't just directly change the data from the outside of an object, especially if there are some conditions to check. So we don't uh, ask for the state of an object, then change the state. We tell the object to do something. So it can, uh, well, it can remain smart. So 
Following just these two pieces of advice, namely tell, don't ask, and law of the matter, uh, we favor uh, creating objects or classes that are more intelligent. OK, so that was the first role stereotype. And the second one, interfacer, uh, it's something, some code structure, that transform information and requests between system parts. Uh, well, we don't have it, anything like that in the code, but you will see a uh, result after refactoring in a moment. Uh, but well, this code base actually screams for interfacer because it has a lot of external systems to integrate with. Well, for emails, it's not that critical because as far as I remember, Django has something for emails, so we can just leave it to the framework. But for custom CRM, booking providers, new payments provider, and legacy payments provider, uh, I think the code base would benefit from, from introducing interfacers. Because if you look at the code, we are doing it manually under if statements. And we have different APIs, different ways of uh, signaling errors. And as you may imagine, the same code with this if statement is repeated inside the code base. It was repeated inside the code base. And the third role stereotype, which we are going to use, is a controller. A controller is just an object that closely directs the action of other objects. So like a conductor, it says other what to do in what sequence. And uh, right now, uh, well, there is something like this in the code base, but it isn't concentrated in one object. It's split between booking serializer, which I wonder if it's the best place to keep it. And it's also in the full finish booking command. So in order to comprehend the whole flow, you need to jump from between two files, between two classes, to only be able to visualize this whole thing. And before we run into uh, rewriting this project, uh, let me do a small disclaimer that we are not trying to work against Django. Uh, if you ever tried uh, doing uh, something against philosophy of Django framework, you know it hurts. And if you haven't had such an opportunity yet, please don't do it. It's not the best idea. We do not want to uh, be smarter than Django authors were. Uh, we want to uh, do something on in areas when Django uh, building blocks fall short. because. In the end, if some responsibility we identify fits into some building block of a Django, which are a model, a view in Django REST framework, also serializer, view set, et cetera, and the uh, object manager, we should just use it and not invent our own creations because it won't look good. Uh, in fact, you can also assign some stereotypes to existing Django building blocks, like information holder, of course, is a model, a coordinator uh, is a signal handler, and coordinator is uh, some code structure that uh, reacts to events. In this, in Django's uh, terms, it's called uh, signals, and will just uh, delegate some uh, some task to other objects. So this is coordinator, and the controller is a view, of course. Um, and please take a note that you don't have to write classes to to see these uh, role stereotypes in your code. As an example of coordinator, signal handler is usually just a function. OK, so now that we know what are the options, let's plan our refactoring. In, uh, and I have a proposition of a three steps uh, refactoring. And this will be, first of all, we introduce interfacers. And this will be a refactoring that will have probably the most, most return of investment uh, on, on all refactorings, because all, always uh, external system are something we do not control. They put some non-determinism to our code. We cannot test with them, usually. We have to mock or patch them anyway. So why not just uh, make it uh, uh, a bit easier for us? Uh, then we'll consolidate controller role, because as you saw, it was split between two classes. I don't see any reason why it would be so. It just makes it harder to read. And the code is eventually written for other people to read it, not for, not for the computer to, to just execute it, because computer doesn't really care. Uh, let's just uh, you know, uh, feel, a, uh, feel some sympathy for the people that will be reading the code afterwards. And eventually, uh, just strip side effects of information holders. And this is something I uh, usually advise to people. But this is my rule of thumb, that the object like booking should not communicate with other uh, external systems in, in, inside. It should be offloaded to controller. 
And the, uh, so the model remains just an information holder. It can do some calculation. The data itself can still check conditions, but it won't communicate with external systems because that's where I think it belongs to controller. OK. So regarding the interfacer, uh, our goal is to make it easy to use from controller so we can limit the amount of information needed to use it and provide a uniform to handle errors because I repeat it for the third time. Uh, one of the libraries used uh, exceptions and the other one uh, used uh, results to signal that something went wrong. So to make it easier to use from the outside, we'll just introduce uh, an interfacer, which will be an well abstract class, and we'll have two implementations: one for for the other, uh, for the one library, and and second for the other. And also, we'll limit, uh, we'll provide some simpler API. For example, this perform zero authentication. Normally, we would have to call a method of one of these libraries, uh, some method for authorization, and pass in uh, I know float zero or decimal zero to just uh, tell it how much money it should authorize. Uh, with interfacers, we can get a more tailored interface. So we'll just write a perform zero authentication method that can accept less arguments. And well, that's always better. The lesser the function accepts arguments, the code will be easier to read and easier to reason about. So we'll just make it easy. Now, about classes, uh, we not always need them. Uh, an interfacer can be as simple as a bunch of functions thrown into some module. And like this could be the case for the interfacer for CRM system. We can just have a single or a couple of functions uh, thrown into a module and uh, it will be our interfacer. It's not important if it's a class or not in terms of object-oriented design. The more important thing uh, is that we have this responsibility covered by some code structure. And it's not like not covered at all, like it was the case for interfacers or it's covered in the, a bunch of other other objects. Um, yeah, so another cool thing about interfacer is that just like I mentioned, external systems often contribute to no determinism. They are difficult to test. We need to stop them anyway. So with interfacers, we are creating such a sta stable point that we can use our patching and mocks on them. So, and also using uh, static code analysis and type hints uh, with tools like MyPy, uh, we get extra uh, extra security, and these points become becomes more even more stable, and uh, we do not have worried too much about the bugs. Mm. So that's it for the for the interfacers. Let's move on to the controller. So the goal would be to have whole flow and overview of a whole flow in one place. So we'll just make it by merging finish booking command class with booking serializer. And we'll start using uh, interfacers there already. So it also becomes a bit smaller, a bit easier. And in the first line, you can see I'll just be using this interfacer for payments and perform zero authentication, then handle error. This is an exception that we just introduced. And if we need to pay anything now, uh, look about the difference between before we had booking that amount that uh, no, booking that total that amount, and now we just use a property if we need to pay anything now. So it's also more more expressive. And okay, if we go we go uh, forward. We do call to the booking provider. We also can handle errors there. And and that that would be it for the booking serializer. Uh, now I'm showing you an optional refactoring that you may use, but you don't have to. And this will be introducing a service, like a service layer for Django. Now, I don't really want to start an existential uh, argument whether a service layer is a good idea for Django or not. I'm just showing this uh, to you as an example of what we can do further. So, I mean, uh, view is something that, in my mind at least, it's coupled very much to the uh, HTTP request and so on. And serializer, uh, where the current logic lives inside, uh, well, it's meant to serialize or deserialize and not perform some uh, communication with third parties. At least that's how I see it. And that's what its name would hint us to, that it's not meant to do this stuff. So I will just leave the serializer uh, as in the highlighted line with just the saving, the booking model. And then we'll offload the, uh, the responsibility for orchestrating all these external services and the booking itself with a booking service. 
And its implementation would look just like a few slides before, so I won't be showing it. It will just be calling these uh, third party uh, uh, third party services via interfacers. And we can call it as a function. And uh, well, I won't be showing the exact implementation, but just pay attention to the uh, to the outline of this class that it will just be uh, containing inside the payments uh, interfacer and the booking client. So in object oriented design, this is known as composition and also encapsulation, because as you can see, the name starts with a single underscore. So it's not meant to be used from the outside. For example, PyCharm ID won't hint you about it. Okay, and last but not least, the most uh, the most pleasant part would be just removing all the uh, side effects causing methods from the model. Because as I, as I mentioned, uh, my rule of thumb is that such things do not belong to models at all, with one exception, uh, but I will tell you about it in a, in a moment. Uh, I think that these methods do not belong to, to the model because uh, this is due to uh, something that in object-oriented design is called cohesion. So uh, cohesion is a measure of uh, how like methods are, uh, are using the fields inside and so on. So usually the booking will have all the information that are needed to cancel the payment or capture the payment um, at least uh, from itself because it knows its total and so on. But suddenly, uh, it has to also know about the payment provider, with the, about the CRM, about the email sending, uh, and so on and so on. So suddenly, uh, Booking needs to know a lot of other thing, a lot of other things, and this will, in the end, cause this class to grow unbounded, and it will grow just bigger and bigger. However, there is one very exception to this. If our model is some kind of a process manager, so the process manager uh, is this kind of pattern that will just coordinate some uh, distributed multi-stage uh, process. And in this case, uh, it also has to keep uh, keep state inside to know at which state state it is. And in this case, our model will be like uh, not fulfilling just one stereotype of information holder, but would be also kind of a controller or a coordinator, depending on the implementation and so on. So it's pretty normal for the objects to fulfill sometimes more than one role stereotype. And uh, well, for the mm, and well for uh, uh, and it's also normal in storytelling when one mm, character uh, also fulfills multiple. Uh, uh, archetypes like in the Shrek, the donkey is not only uh, a companion, but he's also a jester. So it makes people laugh all the time. Yeah. So, and well, that's it about the refactoring. So let's think of, for a moment what we just achieved. So we just switched from a well procedural like style of programming to object oriented like. Uh, we, it's important that we didn't change behavior of the system at all. It still works the same the same way it worked before the refactoring, but now uh, we have all these things nicely compartmentalized, you know, uh, bags called objects. So, and we also uh, used some patterns or all stereotypes to, you know, uh, make them a better metaphor. Because eventually, like I mentioned, the code is written for humans, and humans, uh, and that's also why the reason why design patterns are 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 so popular in some communities because these are common metaphors. They're understood widely by other people. I mean, it's not that easy. I mean, for in languages like Python, when we have a, a lot of freedom and we can also achieve uh, a lot of uh, a lot of things without implementing patterns by some 25 years old book. Um, but it's true, especially in storytelling archetypes. I mean, we quickly recognize some patterns and we can get more hooked onto the story than just uh, wondering who is who in this in this very narrative. So everything that I told you has been inspired by the book Object uh, Design, Roles, Responsibilities, and Collaborators by Rebecca Wears Brock. And this, as I mentioned, this is uh, almost 20 years old book. I believe it was released in 2002. And um, uh, it's a very nice introduction to object-oriented design, which, stop you, uh, which will stop you thinking uh, about it like some mechanical stuff. You will see that a lot of examples I use are from this book. So I warmly recommend it. And well, of course, I showed you some piece of code. And uh, maybe you could tell on the spot that it was bad. Maybe you felt some emotions. 
But if, if not, and you're looking maybe for some more solid uh, proof that this design uh, wasn't good and the object-oriented one is in, indeed better, then Rebecca also wrote an article ho called How Designs Differ. And in it, she uses a different uh, metrics to compare one project written in procedural style and the other one written in an object-oriented style. And she shows some differences between them. But And then there is a conclusion which style proved to be better in taming essential complexity. Of course, spoiler alert, object-oriented was better. And since we are getting close to the ending of this presentation, let me just reiterate that all these object-oriented uh, rules or principles or patterns, how people like to call them, are rather heuristics and not commandments. These are good piece of advice, may hint you towards a better design, but the more you know about them, you will see that you can sometimes break them and nothing bad will happen. It's just that you have to do it uh, consciously. And um, it's not that the code uh, that, for example, I design always have to like uh, meet all of these uh, criteria from solid or from grasp or whatever. Uh, it's just that they give me hints about where to put what, like it was with the side effects uh, methods in uh, in booking model. Uh, well, my knowledge about patterns and uh, grasp, uh, for example, tells me that this is not a good idea. And also be aware that the design is more like an art. Uh, and uh, so there is no one right design. There is no one right way to produce a design uh, or to, to code the project. And uh, there are many good possible solutions and some of them will be a bit better than others, but a lot of them are just feasible, which just work fine. And also be advised that what today is a robust design and what works today, tomorrow may not, because a new requirements arrive and you will have to refactor anyway. And in the end, please don't do a long refactoring journeys like that. L rather do it daily and improve your code bases gradually. So in the end, well, you don't have to do some big banks refactoring when you have to stop delivering for weeks or months because that's not how it's done. It's very risky. So that's it. That was the presentation uh, about uh, refactoring legacy Django application using object-oriented programming. That's my photo when my hair are cut. And breadcrumbscollector.tech is the address of my blog. Thank you. Thanks very much for this talk. Um, that was a lot of information uh, in something which did not seem such uh, like 45 minutes. Um, I would like to remind everybody who watched that, that the slides and the example code are both linked on the schedule. So if you want to look at this again in your own time, uh, you can find it there. We had some nice discussion going on uh, while you were doing the talk and there were some questions but these would be too long to discuss now but some nice comments. For example, somebody uh, like Sirjan uh, really liked your analogy for uh, you, uh, object oriented programming is like actors performing a play. So you got a good comment for that. And of course there was Stefani saying that, that uh, you should not be doing this without tests. <laughs> Um, but uh, if you and, and I see a lot of applause going on in in the uh, opter uh, op room at the moment. So yes, yeah, so just just maybe quickly uh, adding something to these comments. Uh, I don't remember if this analogy about actors uh, came from this book. I supposedly so, uh, but I know that these uh, Rebecca Wirth's book contain these analogies for the cells and uh, and also the the community. So. That also is a great uh, source of inspiration for it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, if you have time, maybe you can log into the uh, Matrix chat uh, in the Opto room and answer some of the other specific questions or clear up some things in the discussion. Um, in this room, uh, we would now uh, take a short break. And before we do that, uh, just a reminder that during the breaks, um, uh, we can. Uh, you can always go into the uh, hallway in the lobby. You can check out the Wonder Me chat where you can talk with cameras, uh, with other participants. And if you've not done this yet, there is a virtual swag bag for you on the website that you can grab. So again, thanks, Sebastian, and we'll see you all. Thank you very much. Thanks.